So uh, I, um, for those who are not familiar with Central Valley, it's, uh, it's massively important to California. It produces uh, tens of billions of dollars in agricultural projects. Um, it's also home to six and a half million people, and the estimate is that there are 92,000 domestic wells in the Central Valley. Um, it's an estimate because those are not regulated um, and they're not monitored. Um, and uh, so the estimate goes that there are about half a million people uh, rely on the domestic wells, um, which is about 8% of the population of the Central Valley. And these wells are threatened by nitrate and other contaminants, but because they are not regulated, they're kind of this unknown risk uh, for public health. Um, we also don't quite know how nitrate moves exactly from the surface to the wells. Um, and that is difficult to impose legislation or regulations to reduce nitrogen loss. If we could say an X reduction of nitrate or, or nitrate or, or nitrogen application at the surface will lead to an, a wide reduction of nitrate in the groundwater, that makes it much more acceptable for a farmer to say, okay, well, I will do that. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we need to work toward sort of this predictive understanding of nitrate in groundwater. And a predictive understanding is a bit of a buzzword, but I like it because it includes both the predictive part that we can say what's going to happen, but also the understanding part, um, because you can predict stuff uh, without understanding it. Um, so this is a, an example of a previous, um, more of a predictive study, which uh, first did a prediction, then the understanding part. Uh, it's a large-scale study by the USGS, published in 2012 by Anning, um, and it used a random forest classifier algorithm. So that works that you start with a lot of explanatory variables. Uh, they go into this random forest classifier, and that sounds about as clear to you as it sounds to me. Um, and they, the random forest classifier predicts nitrate within certain classes. So it is chose six classes with uh, breaks between one half, one, two, five, and 10 milligrams per liter as nitrogen. Um, basically meaning that five of the six are below the MCL and one is above the MCL. Um, the study did a quite a good job of predicting nitrate in each class, but if you look at the highest class, which is most important for uh, health perspective, what, which fraction of the wells is above the MCL, uh, they predicted 45% of them correctly. So, um, and of that, um, it didn't include much of a understanding uh, going into the model. Um, what they did say is that nitrogen and both nitrogen and arsenic prediction accuracy is mostly controlled by local farm, um, uh, local agricultural land use rather than basin-wide agricultural land use. We've had a discussion before that it's, it, that makes it also very difficult to predict because it's very much locally determined. Uh, the study I'm presenting is data collected by Katie. Uh, includes 200 wells, and at each wells, over 50 hydrogeochemical variables were measured. So it's a massive data sheet of a lot of different variables that might explain nitrate or other contaminants. Uh, and we're trying to get a better understanding of which ones do and which ones don't. Um, the variables included in the data set are nitrate, different, several other contaminants, full, uh, water chemistry, isotopes of both nitrate, uh, carbon, and water, and also groundwater aged by tritium helium dating. And that's the part that we did at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Um, in a very short summary, 44% of the wells have concentration of nitrate above the MCL. So almost half of those wells, uh, half of the people will drink water that's above the MCL. Because these are domestic wells, they don't get blended down like public supply wells might or they don't get treated mostly, they're probably drinking it straight up. In addition to nitrate, we found that both uranium and arsenic are also significant problems uh, in 17 and 11 percent of the wells. Manganese is also present in 11 percent of the wells, which is uh, not regulated. It's a secondary uh, maximum contaminant level. The wells are located in two groups that Katie showed before. One is uh, between Modesto and Merced in the northern part of the San Joaquin Valley. And the, the, the southern group is south of Fresno in the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley. The first thing we did um, with those three contaminants was try to find which contaminants coexist. Uh, so we used the K-means clustering analysis. 
and the k-means clustering analysis showed that if you divide them up in four groups, you can explain a large proportion of the variability um, with those groups. Uh, the first four distinct clusters are one, high nitrate and high uranium. The second group is high nitrate. The third group is low everything, so not necessarily below the max MCL, but generally lower than the other groups. And the fourth group is high arsenic. So if you plot those three variables against each other, you can see that arsenic is found in wells where you don't find nitrate, um, but nitrate and uranium can be found in the same well, but you also have a group of wells which have high nitrate but no uranium. Um, so if you plot them spatially, we're hoping to see some spatial patterns. We see it a little bit in that arsenic is uh, mostly focused in, the, in a group, and I hope you can see this better than I can from here. Um, so this blue group is all wells with arsenic. Very close by, we find also red wells, which have both um, nitrate and uranium. Um, we have a few more arsenic and uh, uranium wells up here. And then the yellow dots are the nitrate wells, and they're kind of interspersed in the somewhat higher lying areas. Um, so uh, arsenic shows a little spatial uh, correlation. The other, for the other contaminants, it's, it's much harder. Um, we have groundwater ages for 200 wells, which is great. Um, so we can see uh, whether nitrate or uranium are predominantly found in young or old groundwater. Uh, so this is nitrate, arsenic, and uranium plotted against groundwater age. I need to say this is groundwater age, so it's dated by tritium helium, so it does not include the unsaturated zone. It came up a few times today, and um, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, as I said, nitrate and uranium are found almost entirely in younger water that's less than 30 years old. Arsenic you'll only find in water that's more than 30 years old. So groundwater age is one variable that can predict nitrate, but it's not the only one. Um, there it is. We then looked at uh, land use surrounding the wells. Um, there are four land use classes defined um, within these, each of these uh, well capture areas. Um, and we use the principal component analysis to see how they group. Uh, there are three distinct groups. One is citrus, one is nuts, and the third group is composed of a mix of forage, alfalfa, cotton, and also you see CAFO, which stands for Confined Animal Feeding Operations, dairy uh, farms. Uh, what you can also see in this plot, I hope, uh, is that the blue and red dots are all in this corner with forage, alfalfa, or cotton. You won't find uranium or arsenic under citrus or nut. Uh, land use. That doesn't necessarily mean there is a um, there is a causal relationship. The the land use patterns are uh, spatially correlated, so it might be somewhat of a coincidence. We did do a Kruskal Wallace test to find if there are land use classes that have significantly a larger proportion within a, uh, uh, close to the wells, and we find three of the fourteen do have a significant. A difference. Uh, one is uh, confined animal feeding operations that are higher proportion of land use within uh, the nitrum group. Uh, forage also plots higher for nitrogen and uranium group, but tree fruit plots lower. So it seems that those two land use classes have an impact that uh, results in uranium and nitrate in groundwater. We have stabilized of dopes of nitrate. Um, and they're all, we see some patterns, but they're not completely conclusive. We see that most of them plot in the mixed box between ammonia fertilizer, soil, and on the left edge of manure. Um, we see some signs of denitrification, which is most, li most likely occurring in the unsaturated zone. And then we see a few dots that trend up to the nitrate fertilizer box. So, and those are by those are, in this case, associated with uranium as well. Uh, the last variable I want to talk about in terms of nitrate is water table depth. Um, we see a distinct trend of higher nitrate and uranium at shallow water tables in a northern group, dairy, a group of dairies 
or sorry, northern group of domestic wells, uh, whereas in the southern group of domestic wells, we don't quite see the same pattern. We do see the uranium and arsenic showing up at very deep water levels. Um, so even within, his, within the San Joaquin Valley, uh, water table depth doesn't always work the same way. So it complicates if we want to go to a predictive understanding of nitrate or uranium. Um, Brian Jurgens published a very good uh, paper in Groundwater in 2010 discussing um, uranium in the San Joaquin, eastern San Joaquin Valley, which is pretty much overlaps our study area. Uh, Karen Burrow will give another talk tomorrow afternoon at 2.25, I believe. Um, the mechanism of uranium in groundwater is that it's uh, present in the sediment and it um, is leached out by increased concentrations of bicarbonate. And the increased bicarbonate is due to increased recharge rates during the summer and increased crop growth, increasing the temperature and CO2 pressure in the soil zone. Um, Jurgens showed a plot where nitrate is pre predominantly found uh, very close to the water table. Uh, I tried to plot the same thing, but we lack uh, screen depth information for all wells. So there might be a group of uranium wells in this corner, but we don't know. We do know that uranium does show up in very young groundwater mostly. So there is this link to very uh, short, traffic, short flow paths. Jurgens found a very clean correlation between uranium and bicarbonate, substantiating his claim that it was bicarbonate sort of release. We see the same trends, but at the same time we also see um, both nitrate and and DOC trend with bicarbonate. So it's not just higher uh, concentration of CO2 in the soil, it's also related to nitrate fertilization and higher uh, DOC concentrations. Um, before I move to my next slide about um, uranium, we just did a s report uh, looking at the stabilized slopes of water in rivers and precipitation in California. Because of the unique topography of the Sierra Nevada to the east of the Central Valley, uh, that fractionates the stabilized slopes of water and that makes very distinct isotopic signatures, uh, gives it a nice, distinct isotopic signature to each of the rivers running down from the Sierras. So we have local precipitation at minus eight and then the northern rivers and the southern rivers have much lighter, more negative delta 18 signatures. Um, and this plot surprised me a little bit that um, when you plot those boxes, plot uranium against O18 and plot the boxes on top, um, in the southern group, uh, the uranium is almost all associated with river or water irrigation or with state water irrigation if that's present. And the same for the uh, northern wells with a mix of uh, state water or other river waters. Um, Brian Jurgens also showed that it's related to summer irrigation where recharge temperatures are higher than the annual air temperature. So this both confirms that it's, it's both the irrigation and agricultural activity that increase CO2 in the soil. Uh, although I think DOC is an important intermediate between uh, plant productivity and actually increasing the, the dissolved inorganic carbon or bicarbonate. Arsenic was also one of the uh, variables predicted by Anning. Um, and I'll go through this quite quickly. Uh, there are four factors controlling arsenic in groundwater. That's geological, it's redox, it's pH can be controlling, and also residence time. There is, needs to be some time for water or interaction to release the arsenic. Um, the release process itself can be one of two or a combination in its reductive dissolution where uh, iron uh, oxides completely dissolve or is a change in pH where arsenic uh, gets released from the iron complex. Um, I can't get away with giving a hydrogeochemical characterization without showing at least one piper plot, so here it is. Uh, and I waited for the right moment because the, the wells with arsenic all plot in a very specific uh, sodium bicarbonate group whereas all the other ones um, kind of all overlap. And 
there's not not much to say about the other ones, but arsenic does have a very distinct isotopic or uh, sorry uh, chemical signature. Again, multiple factors control arsenic, so it's uh, in our case mostly anoxic conditions uh, for seven out of the ten wells in this group uh, nitrate was less than 0.05 milligrams per liter for half of them iron was above 0.05 milligrams per liter showing uh, anoxic conditions are more important than the high pH oxic release mechanism um, arsenic is released in water with longer residence times mostly over 30 years um, but it's again it's associated with river water recharge so it plots clearly in this river box for the southern, area, uh, southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, this is different from the uranium case where it's younger water that seems to be irrigated and seems to be releasing uranium. This because some of these wells are over 60 years old. This must be a natural recharge of river water and we know that occurred before we started irrigating um, and that co-locates with where the arsenic is present in the sediments. So I have one slide of conclusion and one more slide if I have time. Um, so in summary we find nitrate, uranium and arsenic are of concern for domestic well water quality. Uh, I didn't show lead because none of the wells were above the MCL for lead but we do see a number of wells which do have lead, uh, significant lead concentrations. Um, there are a lot of factors that control uh, nitrate, land use, groundwater and hydrology are one, of course included. Um, it's nothing that we don't know already, but I hope presenting data like this helps us reach this predictive understanding so we can predict nitrate concentrations better. Um, arsenic seems to be localized and uh, controlled by the geology, whereas uranium seems to be associated with high fertilizer inputs and high irrigation uh, recharge rates. Um, one question I had was, well, the water tables are falling so far because of the overdraft and if water tables are important to nitrate, nitrate transport and perhaps denitrification, how will that, um, how will that work in the future and um, do our models, can we build models now that already account for that before predicting different, uh, different measures to reduce nitrate. The last slide I had was um, dealing with the response times, both in the unsaturated and the saturated zone. If we plot all the wells um, uh, against the water table depth and age and then color code them, uh, we can make four boxes that represent either a quick response, very, very shallow water tables, very young groundwater ages. You could have unsaturated zone delay where you have longer, uh, deeper water tables but still uh, short groundwater ages. Um, or shallow water tables with long groundwater ages or the combination. Um, for the northern dairies, this box is quite promising. A lot of wells are prob will probably respond quite quickly. For the southern dairies, um, uh, sorry, southern San Joaquin, uh, it's more depressing. Um, the water tables are much lower. Groundwater ages seem to be much longer as well. So we, even if we find the perfect, find the right answer, or if even if the farmers would do it right, and leach and zero nitrate to groundwater, it would still take probably several decades before these wells see that effect. Um, but in the in the northern San Joaquin, there's definitely uh, possibilities for improvement on a shorter time scale. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. Any questions out there? John, John Schwinn, Fresno State. Uh, I don't really have a question, but uh, you know, I have a suggestion that uh, if you include uh, pesticide concentrations in the groundwater in your uh, factor analysis, I think that's a uh, you know, a desirable uh, parameters that can be included in there, and right. I bet you have, you, you, you will find that uh, strong correlations between nitrate and uh, pesticides. 
uh, do we have pesticide data in this data set? Katie? Oh. So we don't have them in this data set. So we would like to add that, um, but we can't. Sorry. What's the original source of the uranium? The uranium is um, part of the sediment. It's uh, naturally occurring uranium that is um, part was part of the rock type that formed filled up the uh, Central Valley Basin. So it's naturally occurring uranium, but uh, anthropogenic actions kind of seem to release it at a higher rate than naturally would happen. Is this a health concern at any of the, the rates that you're finding it at? I think it is because a number of them are above the MCL. So it, it is a health concern, yes. <laughs>